So this is a picture of his mother, Lucy Mack Smith, and this is what she said. She kind of summarized the persecution that was going on. Um, she said, for 18 years, they hunted us like wild beasts who were thirsting for the blood of their prey. Without any just cause, they drove me and my family from our home in New York. They ma maliciously cast my husband into prison and despitefully used him. That, that while he was there, they plundered my home and sought my son, another son, Hiram, that they might slay him. In consequence of their abuse, we fled again before them and went to the state of Ohio, where they dragged my son Joseph out of his bed at midnight and beat him. And after he recovered, they still continued to persecute him and the rest of my family so sorely that we were compelled to flee to Missouri, where they again renewed their hostilities against my household and tore my sons from their wives, from their little ones, and from me, that they were thrown into prison, bound in chains, sentenced to be shot, and all this when my sons were guilty of no crime or offense against the law. After my sons had been in the hands of their adversaries for six months, they were compelled to fly from the state of Missouri into the state of Illinois in order to save their lives. For Governor Boggs, who was the governor of Missouri at the time, had decreed that all of the saints found within his jurisdiction after a certain time should be slain by the sword. Next slide, please. And it's surprising how often we don't know this part of our American history. <laughs> But this is the actual, this is a, a photograph of the actual letter that when Governor Boggs um, wrote an executive order, and it's, you can kind of see the scroll, scroll up here, but it says, the Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state if necessary for the public peace. And so one of the other problems for the saints in Missouri was that they were anti-slavery. And, and Missouri was a slave state at the time and also the edge of the frontier of the United States. And so they wanted to be able to maintain their right to own people and have slaves. And so when the, the Mormon settlers started coming in and they were leaving other places trying to gather and find a safe place, well, it ended up being a larger community so that the people who were already there were worried that the Mormons were gonna be voting you know, in a block and then be able to get away, you know, do away with slavery and other things that that um, the, the local um, economy depended on. And, there's, and there was a time um, they were having a, a voting session up in Gallatin, Missouri, and uh, some of the locals actually came out with their, their canes and were attacking the Mormons, <laughs> as they were, the men, as they were trying to vote. So it got pretty volatile and it, was, it got to be very serious again. Um, next, please. So one of the worst, um, accounts of violence that happened in this time period was on October 30th, 1838, um, at a community just near a, a mill that was built right on this creek called Shoal Creek. Um, so Governor Box, he was very misinformed and very prejudiced against the Mormons, and he concluded that the only way to deal with them was to get, get rid of them, either get them out of the state or kill them. And so following that order, it was an executive order, there was about two weeks of basically a heyday of people attacking uh, Mormon communities and um, burning homes, stealing their, their property and uh, destroying their property, and also killing. And so this, this um, example here was probably the worst one. But um, on that day, 200 men rode in on horses with, uh, with their guns loaded and this community was only about 80 men, women, and children, and they were surrounded and uh, and and left. Um, 15 men killed, two little boys were killed, and wounding another 18 men, women, and children, four of whom would die later from their wounds. Um, but just to give you a, an idea of what it was like, what the climate was like, and why Joseph Smith would say better days are coming, this is what it was. This was the bad days, <laughs> really bad days. Well, one of the men who was here and survived, his name was Abraham Palmer. Um, he was camped nearby, and he said that um, the next day after the aforesaid outrage, a company of the mob came to him and, and the men of that, of that um, settlement and said, if you will deny your faith, you can live with us in peace. But if you will not, you must leave the country forthwith on pain of death. Peace or we will exterminate all of you that do not deny your faith, men, women, and children. So it was very clear that it was 
directly associated to their religious faith that they were being hunted down with this. Okay, next please. So here's another story, a woman named Amanda Smith. Um, when the mob came descending in, a lot of the women and the children just ran to the creek. That was the only escape route. They ran down to the creek, and she described the bullets just splattering, you know, hitting the water all around them, and she was with her daughters. Her husband and her sons ran to the blacksmith shop where a lot of the men ran because they had their guns stored there just in case they needed to defend themselves. Um, but they ended up being trapped in there and being shot up through the, the gaps in the logs. And um, so she lost her son, Sardis, who was seven, and her husband, and another, or no, he was nine. Her seven-year-old son, Alma, was seriously wounded when his hip was actually blown off. And so she had no one to help her. And so all she had, all she could do, and everyone was leaving as fast as they could once the, the, um, that terrible event was over, people tried to, they buried the dead as quickly as they could, and people just left to try to get away from this area and away from the mob violence. Um, but she couldn't leave because her son, Alma, was wounded and she was trying to take care of him, but there was no one to help her. Um, no doctors would come. So she, she prayed um, to God for help, and he inspired her with um, a poultice that she could make with herbs and roots that were nearby, and, and was able to apply that to the wound, and just left him still for five weeks. And um, in that time, every day they still had people from the mob coming over and telling them, you have to leave or we're gonna kill you, and she couldn't leave. And so and God protected them so that they were not killed. But um, they were also told, you can't even pray. Don't, we don't want to know anything about your religion going on here. And so, <clears throat> but finally, um, her 11-year-old son named Willard, he later wrote, this godless silence mother said she could not stand. So one day, she went down into a cornfield and crawled into a shock of corn, which had been cut. After carefully ascertaining that no one was within hearing distance, she said that she prayed until her soul felt satisfied. As she left the shock of corn, although there was no one in sight, she plainly heard a voice repeating these words: the, "That soul on who, on who, or I'm sorry, that soul who on Jesus had leaned for repose, I cannot, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake." And those were lines from a hymn um, called "How Firm a Foundation." And Willard said that from that moment, his mother was no longer afraid of the mob, and she inspired her children to have faith. And there's a great story that after that, when her son was finally well enough to leave the state, um, they had no horses, so how were they gonna leave? The mob had stolen her horses, so she went to the, the mob ringleader's house, she knew who he was and where he lived, and she said, I want my horses back. And he said, fine for $5 to pay for the feed bill, and she said, I don't have any money, you stole all of it. And so she just saw her horse was out in the field. She took off her apron and went out there and tied it around the horse's neck and just led him home. And the mob man just kind of stood there like, okay. <laughs> he, he didn't stop her. Um, so anyway, so this, you can see, better days were needed. So next, please. So, uh, you know, it, it got me thinking, you know, why were these people able to stand firm? when so much horror was going on around them because of their religion, because of their faith. Well, this woman, Bathsheba W. Smith, she later became a, a president of the women's organization. Um, she said, when I heard the gospel, I knew it was true. When I first read the Book of Mormon, I knew it was inspired by God. When I first beheld Joseph Smith, I knew I stood face to face with a, living, a prophet of the living God, and I had no doubt in my mind about his authority. So that faith and that testimony was what kept them going. And yes, there were many who did um, leave the church. They couldn't handle the, the pressure. They couldn't handle the, the um, fear. But there were many more who stayed firm. Next, please. OK, so here we are. Nabu was uh, derived from Hebrew word to mean a beautiful location, a place of rest. And so Nauvoo was built right along the Mississippi River um, in northern Illinois. And they bought this land. It was just swampy land, and it was actually really bad at first. And they were stricken with malaria and all sorts of difficulties. But they managed to drain that swamp and build a beautiful city. And so for a few years, they did have some peace and were able to regroup. And they had many more 
people coming from Europe that as a result of missionary work in Europe, um, especially in England and Denmark and Sweden and Germany. And, um, and so people would come with their bags of clothes and maybe a few things and their children and that was all they had. So when they came to Nauvoo, there were a lot of people who were very needy and didn't have food, didn't have shelter, didn't have anything. So, um, so with the Relief Society now established, next please. Um, let's see, oh, okay, sorry, that was kind of But anyway, so what was important to them about the temple, so the temple was kind of the thing that got them motivated initially to organize some sort of women's society, which then became a much bigger organization. But what motivated them to help get the temple built was for these, um, th these different reasons. Because for us in the temple, um, we can perform baptisms vicariously for deceased family members because we believe baptism is essential to be able to return to the presence of God. So that allows the person, because we believe we also have a spirit, so the spirits of the dead can either accept or reject the baptism that was done for them. Um, spouses can be sealed to each other for time and eternity. Children can be sealed to their parents for time and eternity so that families can be together forever. Um, and there's also a, an ordinance called the endowment, which is um, when you receive knowledge, power, intelligence, and guidance from God the Father, so that in your life you have the strength to overcome anything and, um, and be able to stay strong and, and return to live with God again someday. Next, please. So this is just a current map just showing where temples are around the world. Um, I think the red dots are ones that are in are currently operating, and blue are under construction, and yellow are ones that have been announced. So it's been growing, and I think since the 1990s or so, we've got there are more members of the church outside the United States than inside the United States. So probably in the next 10 or 20 years, we'll see a lot more temples being built um, outside the states. But Okay, next one, please. Okay, so um, unfortunately, peace didn't last very long in Illinois either. And, um, and this time, there was a lot of um, dissension and apostasy with, within the church. There were people who were jealous of Joseph's role as a prophet, and they wanted to have power. And so they betrayed him, basically. So... Um, spreading lies to the governor and to others so that eventually um, the governor again of now of Illinois, <coughs> Thomas Ford, began to see the, the Mormons as a nuisance and was also starting to feel like we need to get rid of these people. And so Joseph offered himself to, um, to the state, hoping that if they would try him under whatever accusations they had, that they would then leave the city alone and not bother the people. But he realized at this point that things were so bad that he most likely would not come home um, from get, turning himself into the, the state officials. Next, please. And which proved to be true. Three days later, he and his brother were assassinated while they were um, in jail, which shouldn't happen. <laughs> so uh, a mob um, stormed the, the jail while the militia just kind of watched and they left both Joseph and his brother dead and two other um, prisoners were wounded but survived. Um, next, please. Okay, so now going back to what the women were doing, with all this that was going on, um, there was still a great deal of need. And, and uh, Brigham Young and the rest of the 12 apostles said we need to keep going forward. We can't just let this, this horrible event of losing our prophet stop us from um, doing the work of God, which is to save souls, help people in need, and build that temple that was still under construction. Um, so at this point, the women were then, they had divided the city into the sections, and in each section they sent a group of four women would go around as a visiting committee, and they would assess the needs of the people and come back and say, this family needs this, this family's sick, they need someone to care for them, or this woman is homeless, <laughs> she just arrived, she has nowhere to stay. And so then they would go around and say, can you donate anything? Do you have anything that you can give? And so they would re receive donations and then, and then distribute them again. So they, they were able to donate things. You'll see in, in the, the Relief Society minutes that people were donating soap and food and clothing. And um, they would donate their time and say, I can knit, I can sew, I can go wait on someone who's sick. 
And so in that way, they help to kind of oversee the needs of all the people. 